Look around you. So much of our modern world is new. New ideas, new buildings, new narratives. And that's great. Change is necessary for progress. The whole world gets it. So how is it possible that despite all this progress, we still learn in the exact same way our grandparents did? Our education is evolving so slowly. But why? What if your education could evolve and improve as quickly as the world around us does? What if your education was designed to help you discover who you really are? If students were created like co-creators instead of just products? If there was a space meant to build connections between teachers and students? A place where safe space doesn't mean you'll be shielded by censorship. Where liberty isn't just what you learn, but how. Your education should keep up with the rest of the world. And now, it can. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mónica de Celaya, soy decana de la Facultad de Ciencias Económicas de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín. Bienvenidos a la segunda UFM Talk, impartida por la Facultad de Ciencias Económicas. Quiero recordarles que esta será una serie de 20 talks acerca de diversos temas desde las diferentes facultades y departamentos de la UFM. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. El día de hoy, Vamos a hablar sobre este tema tan fascinante que es Reshaping Our Future. Y nos damos cuenta que cada uno de nosotros estamos en el centro, en el centro de la acción para poder modificar nuestro propio futuro. Cada uno de nosotros, aún en este momento difícil que estamos viviendo, tenemos en nuestras manos, en nuestra mente, la capacidad de reinventarnos, la capacidad de darle una nueva forma a nuestro propio futuro. Y para hablar de esto, el día de hoy tenemos a dos invitados que nos van a acompañar eh, durante esta hora que vamos a estar juntos conversando con ustedes. En primer lugar, les voy a presentar a María Kashmit. María es emprendedora en el campo de la comunicación, habiendo cofundado varias empresas en dicha industria. Actualmente es gerente general de Zen Interactive Media, una agencia boutique digital. Es graduada de licenciada en publicidad y literatura de SMU, Southern Methodist University, y tiene una maestría en comunicación corporativa de IE Business School en España. También es catedrática de nuestra facultad y forma parte de la junta directiva de Fundesa y también es vicepresidente de la junta directiva de Maya, el primer colegio para niñas en Centroamérica ubicado en Sololá. También nos acompaña Eric Glostrom. Eric es fundador de una eh, serie de emprendimientos sociales relacionados con educación. Voy a pasar a hacer la presentación en inglés. Eric Glostrom is the founder and CEO of Watson Institute and founder of Educate, two organizations transforming education worldwide. Watson Institute is a re-imaged model of higher education for next generations of entrepreneurs and leaders with locations in Boulder, Colorado, and South Florida, which recently launched an exciting partnership with UFM to offer a minor in impact entrepreneurship. Educate reached over 50,000 students across Uganda, Rwanda, and Kenya through mentorship-based leadership and entrepreneurship program that has significantly influenced the national curriculum and exam of Uganda and Rwanda. He is graduate of Amherst College in biochemistry and recognized as an Ashoka Fellow, Echoing Green Fellow, and twice recognized as one of Forbes 
30 social entrepreneurs under 30. Eric's work is driven by simple belief to solve the toughest challenges facing humanity. The place to start is within the hearts and minds of the next generation. So welcome both of you. And we are here to talk about this fascinating topic of reshaping our future. Welcome Eric and Maria. They are joining us for tonight. And uh, well, feel comfortable to speak in English, Spanish, switching naturally uh, with our audience. And we are having this great opportunity to have this conversation, this dialogue, and also opening up for questions with the audience. First of all, I would like to ask you, what does it mean for you reshaping our future? We were having this conversation yesterday night with Maria, and she was telling me, well, everybody's hearing this idea of reimagine, recreate, reshape the future. And what does it mean? How does it look like? So when you think about this, what comes to your mind? What is this idea of reshaping our future? Any of you? Maria, please, please start. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for, for being part of this uh, great talk. Uh, hi, Eric. Hi, um, Monica. For me, it's an honor to, to be participating with all of you and to share a little bit of my experience on, on how to how everybody is reshaping or recreating. I, I've heard a lot the word reinventing, especially the, the people who are in business right now. We have to reinvent ourselves. We have to reinvent our business model. And I've been getting all these questions uh, from students, from my employees, from clients. What does that mean to reinvent ourselves? And um, I've been thinking about that. You know, also I have been reinventing myself as well. And it's a very philosophical thing to 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 say from one day to another in, in a situation that, that, like the one we're living right now. I, you know, we need to change. And sometimes, you know, change comes with a lot of fear, with a lot of questions involved. So for me really reinventing myself is questioning me um, how can I do things uh, in order to things differently in order to be uh, part of what's happening right now what's relevant to people right now uh, not relevant only to myself or to my business and answering those questions then all of a sudden I start to get some answers and probably not being fearful to change is, is one of the things that I really recommend a lot to people right now it's it's um You know, it's 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 just embracing change. It's being part of change. It's looking for change. I have a I have a quote in the company that says, <laughs> "Either we change, or the clients change us." You know, mm -hmm. that's that's part of like the the the, the mantra uh, in my business because I'm in the digital world and, and you know everything's changing so fast. So basically, that is it's how can we reinvent ourselves? Sometimes it's not you know to change who we are. In essence, is trying to find. Uh, ways of doing mm -hmm. different things uh, and being relevant. Like sometimes it could be your business model, sometimes it could be your product, sometimes it has to be the way you uh, deliver your product, sometimes it's your communication. Uh, so so in, in, in situations like the one we're facing right now worldwide, I think it's being relevant to humans. That's that's the main key here. So I'll, I'll give the word now to, to Eric. That's well said. Thanks, Maria. And it's great to be here. Thank you, Monica, and everyone who's joining. I hope you're all having a great evening. And I'm excited to be part of this UFM Talks. Um, so it's an interesting question about what does reshaping our future mean? And I guess the thing that first comes to mind is it seems like we're, we are in a point in human history, almost like a fork in the road um, and a turning point. And it seems like a real opportunity where um, we have a lot of potential to shape what our collective future looks like. And it would be, it feels like it would be a waste or a shame to miss that opportunity. And someone told me recently, they said this generation, in fact, I think the generation of many of the people who are joining today could be the, gener the very first generation in all of human history to see the end of extreme poverty and to see a world in which every child has access to a quality education um, across the world, 100%. And You know, it's interesting to think that our kids and our grandkids may may only learn about poverty in a museum. Um, and that is very encouraging and inspiring for me to think about knowing that we actually have the potential to reach that kind of world and that kind of future, because I think that's the kind of future that everyone wants to see. 
Um, but it really requires a lot of individuals taking leadership, taking entrepreneurship, making a change in their own lives, their own communities, their own their own sp spheres of influence. Um, and and for me, that's what reshaping our future is all about. Is what is that individual action that we can all take to get to that collective future that we want to see? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Very interesting, uh, different points of view of what reshaping the future means. And uh, thinking about this moment that we're all living and uh, how we can find opportunities in the middle of what we are. I would like to start asking you, what are the main challenges we may have as individual persons in our own lives uh, regarding this process of reshaping the future? What challenges do we have to, to start that process? What, what challenges do you see? And how you may think it's a great idea to address them in, in the, this very moment that we are living? Perfect, I'll start. Well, I think um, I mentioned it before. I think one of the one of the barriers that we humans have whenever change uh, gets proximate to us is definitely fear, fear of change. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, everybody's that I've talked to in the last recent weeks is it's, it's, it's a natural feeling and and how to overcome it, I think, um, is letting go control i think it's one of the first things that we should do as entrepreneurs as, as as humans you know we don't have control of anything and that's something that i think this uh, all this covid situation has has been giving us a great learning experience of you know nobody is in control of anything so we have to really flow a lot with uh with embracing embracing change another one is i think there's a fear also sometimes of uh or or, or not fear it's it's a uh, I don't know, we don't have much experience sometimes of, of how to collaborate with each other. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity right now. Uh, I, I, I've talked to so many people that are trying to make, you know, that I see so many opportunities in situations like this one that are just looking for other ones that have this A or have C or B and they just need to connect the dots. And we're so afraid of Oh no, that's my idea, or that's my business, or that's you know that that's my my you know that 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 thing of letting go again and uh, and and started I don't know to change uh, to a mindset of of more collaboration of uh, how can we all be part of something greater than our business or you know or ourselves even. Mm -hmm. Great answer, Maria. What do you think, Eric? I I fully second Maria. I mean, I think that's. That's exactly where my mind was going, is how do we leverage our collective strengths in order to overcome those challenges? And I always go back to the education system because the education system is designed in a way where I think it oftentimes is the root cause of a lot of these challenges because it's not really unleashing the individual's creativity, the individual's leadership, the individual's purpose in their own lives to go out and, and create change and, and to shape the future um, if I can just share a quick story that Maria's answer made me think of, it's this fable of a father and a son. Um, and as Monica and Maria know, I've you know recently my wife and I gave birth to our first son, so it hits home because it's a father and a young boy who are walking through the woods one day, and they come across a big log in the middle of the road, a fallen tree, and the son looks to his dad and says, "Dad, do you think I could pick up this this tree?" You know, and the dad looks at the tree, looks at his son and says, well, I think you can, but only if you use all your strength. And so the son rolls up his sleeves and gets down and lifts with all his might and the tree doesn't go anywhere. And so he falls back. He, he you know, he, he looks at his dad and he says, dad, I tried my hardest. Why couldn't I pick up the tree? The dad says, again, you know, if you use all your strength, you can do it. The son tries again. It doesn't work. And he falls back exhausted this time and he looks to his dad and he says, why, why am I not able to do it? And the father says, well, you never used all your strength because you never asked for my help. And that really hits home because I think like Maria said, if we find a way to truly collaborate um, and build partnerships and build collaborations, that will enable us to use all our strength and collectively we'll be much stronger to overcome a lot of these challenges. Mm -hmm. I like that story so much. And also, I mean, when you mentioned fear, Reading about fear, one of the 
things that some research say, say about it is whenever you are feeling fear, the first thing that you need to do is make a list of those things that you are fearful about. So right now we are so much fearful of what we are reading. I mean, we are reading so many bad news and all this very preoccupating news about what it is COVID-19, what it have if it happens to me, um, the way it evolves along the time, what it has mean, meant for different countries and for different economies. So the first question that we need, need to ask ourselves is, what are you fearful about exactly? So then you can focus your efforts and in those things that are really directly connected with you because you cannot find with the whole thing that is going on in the world. You need to focus on some very specific things that can be, I mean, a risk for yourself. So in a way to make, make this short list could be an easy thing to do. Another interesting story I heard the other day in a discussion like this, uh, it, I didn't know this. It says, well, we hear this idea that in the most difficult moments are where the greatest new things come. And that sounds incredible, but Sounds incredible. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, I mean, that's like a movie. But um, the other day, one person shared this story of Isaac Newton, and it says that he invented calculus in a moment like this, where the college, in he, he was studying his first year, and the, the college locked, was locked down by, by a situation similar to this. And during that year, he invented calculus. I was so surprised about this story. Of course, I know people, not everybody loves calculus. So maybe some would be thinking, oh my God, why, why did he have this great idea in his mind? But um, at the end, I mean, it was a great contribution for humanity. And it happened in a lockdown situation like this, a whole year being out of college because they cannot attend. And they were, I mean, in a very different moment in time where technology was not part of it. So I think that just thinking that there's a possibility of that and reading stories like this can make us feel inspired. And I think that's a very powerful thing to think about. Um, regarding this, the power of a vision, what do you think that vision or envisioning uh, plays an, import, an important role right now in this process of reshaping the future? I mean, you need to discover within yourself some of these new things that you are envisioning for the future. What role does vision play in, in this moment and this process of reshaping? I'll start with, uh, with a quote that I heard the other day that really resonated with my heart. Um, it says, hope is not a, a sentiment, it's not an emotion, hope is a plan. And when, when fear knocks the door, hope is the one who has to open. And you really need to have a plan. I mean, the only thing that gives you peace in your heart and in your mind whenever you feel fearless is uh, you, you know, starting to, to plan something. And planning comes with vision. I mean, you really need to be creative enough to, to stop and put your fear aside and say, okay, what am I going to do? Like, like Monica was saying, okay, what, what really is affecting me? How is it affecting me? For example, I, call, I come from the digital world. That, that's the, the industry that I work for. And um, I, I've been asking myself, you know, with all this, you know, all, all this amount of information that we have about the virus that changes so much every day, you don't know what to read, what source and everything. And, and it really, I, to, like two weeks ago, I, I did a cleanup of my, of my social media because I ended up with so much, you know, information and, and I really put some barriers to it because it was, you know, it wasn't affecting me, but I did never realize and stop fully to, you know, do like this checkup of, of all this information that was coming from so many sources from Twitter, from Facebook, from Instagram, that right now, I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but Instagram now looks like a catalog, like a product catalog mm -hmm. in, in, the recent, in the recent weeks. So everything's changing a lot, but, but that, that quote that, I, that, that resonated here uh, gave me a lot of peace because I, I think that really when, whenever you, you need to change, you need to have a plan. And, and hope is, is something that it's easy to say, but if you don't have a plan, then, then hope hope will disappear just like like the word you know so planning for me is something really strategic sometimes 
for example, right now I have a client, um, they're in the construction industry and what they, what they did, they, they're not selling houses right now, but what they did is it's like, what can we do in this, in this situation? And what they did was work in strategy because we're coming out of this. So we can become stronger during this type or we can become weaker. So, you know, they've changed their strategy. They're training their team with the latest, you know, things in the in the market and in their, their industry. They're, they're doing a lot of, they're preparing themselves. So whenever we reactivate the economy and whenever, you know, we're able to become a little bit more normal from the normal that we, we used to know, it, they come different. So I think it's it's a really it's a really interesting time also to really reshape, rethink, and replan everything that you have. Mm -hmm. hmm. Excellent. Yeah, great, great comment. I like that quote. I mean, hope means planning. I love it. Yeah, Eric, what do you think about it? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I fully agree. And I think the power of a vision, the power of a vision and a plan, the power of hope and a vision and a plan is really, you know, some of the active ingredients that allow us to make change in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think uh, that one of the beliefs that Watson Institute is built on is that a young entrepreneur with a powerful vision, with a calling, is one of the most powerful forces of change that we've seen, that we know of in the world. And mm -hmm. um, obviously it's not just the entrepreneur, it's the entire team, the group of people who share in this vision and this belief. But, you know, you asked about the power of a vision, and it's honestly one of the most powerful forces of change in our world, especially, as Maria said, when it's combined with a strong plan. And um, so much of what we do at Watson Institute is about, and I imagine many of the people on this, you know, presentation are thinking, well, what if I don't have a vision? Or how do I know what my calling in this life is? What does that look like? What is my purpose? And one of the things we really think a lot about and focus on is, is this concept of a moment of obligation. And what is a time in your life, a moment, it could be a split second or it could be a period of several months where you just felt absolutely obligated. You knew you had no choice but to change something about your life, about the world, about the community we live in. And many of us, if we think back to our own lives, we say, oh yeah, there was that intense period, a very formative period whereby I felt called or obligated to make a change. And then some people will look back and say, well, I don't feel like I've had my moment of obligation yet. Um, and I think the key is to be open to it and to put ourselves into situations and positions whereby we can find that moment of obligation and really hear that calling that we have for our lives. And going back to the concept of fear, um, one of the things that I believe and we, we think a lot about at Watson Institute is that oftentimes it's our fears that become our fuel. So it's our fears that fuel our vision. It's our fears that fuel that moment of obligation. So rather than running from our fears, we should listen to them and recognize that actually they may be a sign pointing us in the direction of that vision that, that, that we have for our lives, that moment of obligation that's waiting for us. Wow, that's a very powerful, I mean, deep moment of asking ourselves this great question of what's my voice? I mean, what, what do I feel attracted to? Um, if I put my eyes on my vision, and I think this is powerful, I mean, in moments of change, one of the most important energy providers is that future that you can see. And uh, definitely to put the eyes in the future can help you st start to discover new paths, new ways, uh, and even connected with this deep um, way of identifying needs or desires that you would like to get involved and connected with the natural sense of uh, of an entrepreneur or as Israel Kirchner, the famous economist, would define an entrepreneur. Uh, the entrepreneur is that person that can really smell, detect opportunities around the corner. And those opportunities are normally connected with the capacity to identify needs. So whenever you are talking about this capacity of finding your own voice, your own vocation, I mean, your, it's, it's connecting these with needs that you can see around and, and you can feel that you can really be a solver. So I think that's a very interesting thing. And um, also when I was here in Maria, I was thinking, yes, I mean, this plan is very important. One thing that is very different right now, and I would mention three specific ad adjectives. One is we need it to be very simple. 
I mean, one of the things that we need to do is we don't want very complex things because we know they're going to change <laughs> very soon, faster than we can imagine. So we don't want to deal with very complex things. We want simple things. We want very transparent information that we can share with our team or our, I mean, family or your classmates, whomever is involved with a project that you are developing. And, and also, I mean, I was thinking this capacity of be very flexible, to move faster. Regarding education and the experience our students are living right now, what are some of the skills you think a student can develop during this moment uh, that they have to move forward in a very different environment, learn different things, and uh, get used to a world that is going to be a different world. So what are some of those skills that you think that are really important and relevant for students to develop and for us as educators to think about them because we can help them through this process to um, be better, strengthen those skills in themselves? Good question. Perfect. I'll start. A um, few years ago, I... Um, I did my executive master degree that was online. I had to travel to Spain every two to three months for two weeks and then uh, have online you know, courses during the week. It was completely, I mean, for me, having you know, online uh, courses was something really new five years ago. And it was something really challenging as well because I thought like executive programs could understand that you know, we work and we have this double life, triple life, because you have your personal life, your professional life, and also, you know, your, your, your master's. And it wasn't like that. It was a lot of work. I remember that, um, you know, I, I work until like six, seven at night. And, and then I went to, to, you know, we had this, like, it was like a, like a blackboard, you know, where, where the professor put some questions and then we had to do the readings. And, and after we have to, you know, make some discussions. Imagine myself, all the Europeans and the Asians and the Africans have already participated by that. So I have to be really creative on, on my answers. So I, I could experience online education uh, since a long time ago. And it was 13 really long and hard uh, months that I really now appreciate because it gave me a lot of resources on, on how to give, you know, online classes during this um, COVID situation. Um, when you have online courses, you really need to prepare yourself. Like there's no, well, eh, I'll go to the class and, you know, eh, we'll see if she, if the professors ask or not. I mean, you really need to be present in order for the professor to actually, you know, see that you, you want to participate. And if you don't prepare yourself, I mean, Sometimes I'll, I'll do that in my class. Like, what do you think that person? Or uh, what I did on the on, on the final on the final project was I'll, I'll grade on, on the good questions people did. So m making good questions, mm -hmm. I think, is it's part of what students should be doing right now because nobody has answers right now of a lot of topics, especially uh, in the one that we're living at right now. So for me, those key things like prepare yourself really good for classes and uh, be able to ask good questions are two key players and, and listen to each other because as we were talking with Eric right now, I mean, collaboration is, is one of the key things that people that are confined right now uh, have to do. I mean, you have to be able to make uh, group projects or, you know, uh, group sessions or whatever, uh, you know, with this with the distance thing and, and the collaboration and listening to each other. Uh, it's part of communication as well, listening and asking good questions. So, I mean, we, we're not separated from the core things that actually, you know, it, we, we used to do before. But I think right now with the uh, tools that we have and with the situation, it becomes really more important to be more prepared, ask good questions and listen more. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Maria. How about you, Eric? What do you think about it? Definitely. I mean, I think just like Maria said, some of these things are not new or they aren't revolutionary. Asking questions is has been around since the time of Socrates and well before, and the Socratic method still remains today as one of the most powerful ways to educate a group of people because we're drawing out that knowledge and that potential within other people by asking the right questions, by forcing us to explore new ideas. And I think that's exactly the kind of education that we want to see. And education, more than anything, has to start with the individual. It has to be about the individual because we're all unique. 
We were all given unique gifts. We were all given a unique calling, a unique purpose. And any kind of education that tries to disregard that or think that we all need to come out looking alike and doing the same things is just completely off base. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in many ways education started back many, you know, hundreds of years ago with this focus on the individual asking questions, drawing out the real purpose as, you know, the Latin root of the word is of, ed of education, educata is draw out what's within. Right, and that was what education was all about, was drawing out what's already within us. But I think as the industrial revolution came along, schools started to look more like factories. And we started to say, okay, everyone by the age of 13 needs to be able to do A, B, and C. Everyone by the end of 17 needs to be able to do D, E, and F. By the time you graduate college, you should all be able to do the same things and speak alike. And that's, you know, that's what we need with a factory that produces cell phones but it's not what we need in our school system. We need something that focuses on the individual and draws out the unique calling, the unique talents, the unique purpose that we all have. And that's what I love about UFM is that that's where, that's really the idea that UFM is built on. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great, uh, great reflection. I mean, a, a great thought that we need to be connected with. Actually, I was hearing the other day um, a conversation between deans of different universities in the world, and they were discussing of, well, what's the new image of educational institutions? And I think it's exactly on the line of what Eric mentioned. And they said, well, if we're talking about innovation, we need to unbundle what we have now in universities. And we have so many things related, but at the end is, is a process that happens in you, like a specific person. So then each of us as educators or connected with education, we need to think, how can we help our students individually to live an incredible learning experience that will change their lives forever and that will help them uh, get involved in this process of reshaping the future continuously because this is not going to happen once i mean i hope COVID it, it's coming to an end in some point but there's going to be other challenges in the future so at the end the great question is um, what's happening in yourself along this way of learning along this way of developing new skills and along this way of rewriting a future that you have right now the all the rights to rethink about it and just try to explore it and start moving forward um i was thinking about the word resources i mean when we think in on the future and we think that we're moving forward the first question that comes to the table and that's the same for any type of person, individual, or an entrepreneur, I mean, everybody has this big question. Well, resources. Right now, we have a lot of scarcity of resources. So the question is, how can we focus to go and move forward towards the future regarding this great question of resources? Maria, at the beginning, mentioned the word collaboration. I was thinking all the time of the word relationships. I mean, that's one of the most important things that we have right now. And by the way, we're locked down with some of the most important relationships if, of our lives. So are these opportunities to have conversations we haven't had before regarding our own future, for example? So what do you think about resources? Do you really think they are scarce right now more than ever? Do you think that no, they, they're not that visible? Or we have to be more creative to identify how to find them. What do you think about it? I think um, in my standpoint of view, resources have always been there. This is not an exception. What I came with my, with my I don't know, experience in the last few weeks is that my resources were my people around. And sometimes we regard resources as being, I don't know, economic resources or, you know, because people have this, this mentality that resources need to be related with money. And I think the situation has turned us over and has, you know, we, we have all learned that it's about people and it's about people being good. And if some people are not good, everybody's not good. And um, I mean, I have a digital agency and what we sell is our services. It's, it's our time and our expertise. So when I did, had to do a lot of changes in the company the, the first few weeks, uh, I remember those, those really hard weeks. My, my largest client are the largest uh, malls here in Guatemala City. 
So you can imagine myself, you know, they're my largest client and they're, they're, they're being closed for three months now. And um, I have to reinvent myself and quickly. I did not have time. And well, what do I have? What are my resources? And when I turn around, it was, you know, a complete team of really talented people that were same scared as myself. I mean, we were all scared saying what's going to happen. Everybody was trying for me to give the answers. And this is one of the things that, that really came to my mind with collaboration, because when I had to make decisions, really hard decisions on the company the first weeks, I make everyone part of it. It wasn't like me saying, being the CEO and saying, you know what, we have to cut costs and we have to cut people and we have to, okay, this is the situation, people. And these are the options. What do you think is the best for all of us? Especially this month that it was April, it was the worst month, the, the worst month for me, uh, uh, particularly. And it was such a relief, you know, to see how everyone in my team got it in a really good sense that I were were seeing them as a resource for for me for all these answers that I was looking for as the leader of the company, but also not not only to take them into consideration, taking into account their opinion, and also taking taking. Uh, uh, them as as the as the solution because at the end I had to you know reshape rethink reinvent a lot of our products and they are our products I mean my company you know it's it's a closed what is my company right now it's a, it's a closed office in zone ten a logo no it's a lot of people working uh, selling what they know and how to do it so it was amazing for me to find out that the most precious and valuable resource I have. It's people that I work with and that I value so much more uh, now. It's, I've always valued them, but now it's really like, I say it's my dream team. Mm -hmm. Wow, that, are, that was a great question. I want to, I, I'm moving towards Eric, but uh, while I'm moving towards Eric, I would like to remember everybody that is with us right now that we're moving forward to the uh, question section. So please start writing your questions right away so we can really get connected with you. Eric, can you let us know the answer to that question of resources while we start receiving some questions? Absolutely. I don't know if I know the answer, but I fully wholeheartedly second both what Maria and Monica, what you both said, because it's, you know, resources are don't exist outside of relationships. Um, you know, we don't just find resources on the side of the road. We we build relationships and those relationships are the core, kind of the, the starting block, the seeds of any and all resources that we need. And so we are in a time where where it might seem like resources are scarce, but we we are not prevented from building relationships. And those powerful relationships are what enable us to achieve a vision to, you know, to pursue our purpose in our own lives. And, and I think when we talk about, you know, well, what should an education it consist of and Um, where do we find resources? Well, it comes back to relationships. And if an education isn't providing the space to create those key powerful relationships, then it's ultimately not enabling it to be truly resourceful. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't agree more with, with what you both said. I'm so glad that's where the conversation is going, is, is that focus on relationships. Hmm, focusing on relationships. And right now, I mean, being in institutions uh, like UFM, for example, helps you build relationships with so many people. I mean, your classmates, people from uh, years ahead, years behind you, your teachers, your assistant professors. I mean, it's it's an amazing opportunity. Uh, like an example of that is this great meeting that we are having right now to discuss. I have a, a very interesting comment here and a question from the same person. That's Maria Jimena Benitez. Actually, she's a graduate from our school. Hi. Marijena, I absolutely agree with planning in order to face fear and solve problems. And her question is, how do you motivate our team members to leave behind the analysis paralysis syndrome due to all the information, fear, negative news, and help them to start moving forward toward the changes that are needed to overcome the new challenges? What do you think about this question? How do you motivate our team members? Wow, that's a question that I've been asking myself for the past weeks. And um, what I did <laughs> last week, it was amazing. I, I sent everybody a quarantine motivation box. And it had a gratitude journal 
it had some popcorn to see some Netflix. It had, uh, we are all ladies in our, in our agency. So we had a lot of things to pamper ourselves. And uh, I, I think it was a really good thing and, and, and a beer because we needed to have that, that uh, Friday that everybody was receiving their box, you know, uh, an, an office quality, after office quality time where we can actually talk about how everybody's feeling. I mean, we, all, we have this, you know, routine of, of every single morning, be it at 8.30 in a Zoom meeting, you know, what are the things that we have to do going through that to-do list that sometimes it could be endless. And, and that causes paralysis because sometimes, you know, we have all these to-do lists that it's like, I don't know, 10, 15 things. What do we do? What do we do first? And then you have a lot of paralysis. But I think that building relationships, going back to what Eric was saying, it re resonated me a lot with that because after all, I mean, this digital uh, acceleration that we're all living in, it, it, sometimes, I mean, I have to connect to this Zoom so I can learn from these two, two guides. I have to connect to this so I can learn, learn, learn. And we forget to connect ourselves to see and just, you know, hey, you know, how are you? How, how have you been feeling? Uh, can I help you with something? I know you have a lot of to-dos and mine are three or four. That's what I heard in the meeting today at Zoom. I mean, looking forward for your team and being human at the end because it's not like you know motivation especially the ones that you know that are on top right now in the top line where do we find motivation if we're so worried about you know we have to pay we have to you know serve the clients we have to do some a lot of things and i got to the conclusion that you know days go went by and, and at the end it, it's all about being being true and honest to your team and and, and keep on building those relationships regardless, regardless of the situation that we're living in at so, so that really helped me, and I really like, recommend for everyone uh, to create their box. It, it, it became such a great experience for everyone in my company. Thank you, Hi. thank you, Maria. Eric, what do you think about it? I want, I want to join Maria's team. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that's a, it's a very interesting question, and I think what comes to mind is that it's, uh, I don't, motivation, I feel like people are so motivated right now but sometimes we just don't know which way to go and where to start because it's chaotic. There's so much unknown information. There's, we're facing so much uncertainty. And one of the key skills that I think, you know, teams need to master and that we need to focus on is how do we navigate through times of uncertainty? How do we lead through times of uncertainty? And how do we move forward in spite of the fact that we simply don't know all the information? And one of the things that comes to mind is just for teams, you know, Maria, and then to, to answer your question, for, for teams to just know that we're all in this together, we are going to make mistakes because we can't predict the future and there's a lot of unknowns, but we're going to make mistakes together. We're going to dissect our failures together. We're going to celebrate our successes together. And we're truly facing this challenge as a team. And I also think about a lot of the students who are on the call today who are maybe thinking about university and in an unprecedented situ situation whereby you know you have to be choosing university and going away during a time of a pandemic i mean we haven't had a generation that's faced a challenge like this perhaps ever so the whole analysis paralysis of choosing university and your next steps is very very difficult for students and also recent graduates right now and i think you know, it, it, it ha I don't know if I know the full answer to it, but what I do know is that if we don't act, if we don't move forward, then um, that's probably not the best way, you know, the best way to approach this challenge. We have to find a way to still move forward, to still make choices that are to the best of our guess, the closest to what our calling and what our purpose is. So as a student figuring out what do I do next, you know, just know that we aren't gonna have all the information and that's a very, anxious time because there's so much uncertainty, we still have to make choices and find a way to move forward in spite of it. Thank you, Eric. And actually, I remember this, this uh, quote, I don't remember the name of the person who wrote it, but he says, uh, uh, if you can run, walk, if you can walk, crawl, but never stop. And I think that's what we are living right now. I mean, we really need to keep moving forward and we will not know if the steps we are taking are the correct ones. Nobody knows. But what we do know is that we, if we stand there and do not move, the risks to just 
st stop forever are higher. So I think that's a very important thing. You just keep moving small steps and discovering continuously. I have a question here from Stephanie Faya. She says, uh, thank you, Monica, Maria, and Eric for sharing your experience. What do you think is going to be the most relevant change after the pandemic is over? What do you think is going to be the most relevant change after the pandemic is over? And Eric, if you want to go first, it's fine. You don't have to keep the, the same order. <laughs> oh, please. This is a hard, a hard question. Maria, I'll try to go first, but then you, you'll help me do, I'll let you do the cleanup, as they say. So, um, oh my gosh, I don't know if there's going to be one change, but what I have heard that I think is very interesting is that um, this pandemic is going to accelerate the transition that was already happening in education from um, this, you know, intense marriage and focus on in-person education to an accelerated recognition of universities of the ability to do virtual education effectively. Um, and not to say that I think we should ever get rid of in-person relationships and the magic that comes from that, because that's what Watson Institute and UFM are built upon is the magic that comes from that time together in person. But I think we are finding an accelerated shift to recognize as, as a, in, within education, the power of, of a virtual model. Um, and that's something that I know UFM has done extremely well over the past several months of transitioning everything to virtual, um, you know, without having any warning that that was going to have to happen this year, so. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you know, I mean, I really feel proud of the UFM team. They're amazing. In 48 hours, all was moved towards live online. And I, I think that was totally, totally amazing. Um, thank you, Ariel, for your comment. Wonderful talk. Thank you. I have another question here from Carolina Uribe. And she says, uh, so great to hear from you guys. And uh, what are some of the things or actions we can do today to start to reshape our future? What are some of the things and actions we can do today to start to reshape our future? I'll go again with the, with the planning. I mean, just as Eric mentioned a couple of answers ago, I mean, you really need to move forward. There, there needs to be a plan. And I think um, choosing one with the option of, of failing has to be part of the plan as well. I mean, there has to be an exit strategy somewhere uh, that if that plan doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. I mean, some people get this so seriously. Life is a little bit more you know, flexible than what we think it is. So I think planning is, is, uh, is one. Um, I think this this pandemic thing has teach us also on 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 how connected we are, and we need, really need to 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 foment a little bit more that connectivity in good ways. Uh, you know, I've been I, I've been really enjoying uh, having dinners with my mom on Saturday by Zoom, watching my 80 year old dad on Instagram. It's fantastic. <laughs> he, he has been sending us, you know, all these uh, like tasty kind of recipes. You know this excel digital acceleration that we are we're living right now, and 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 opening ourselves to being part of it and to teach older generations on how to be part of it is extremely great. I mean, that's one of the things that has really made me really happy. It's not because I come from that industry, but the the, the digital acceleration is something that some I, I remember my parents being. Oh no no I cannot do that and now I mean there's no other way so fomenting that uh, digital acceleration to everyone I think is it's 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 good and um, how to stay connected with everybody as well I mean sometimes uh, I don't know I, I ask myself if I want really want to go out of my house how can I go out of my house without going out of my house I don't know if I can explain myself like that but there are many ways and creativity plays a key role here. So creativity, uh, planning, and you know, embracing this digital digital acceleration is going to be a great tools for everyone to reshape their future. Thank you, Maria. I like that idea of the role of creativity and not just trying some ideas. You anyway, know, I mean, you are in a point where you are less or worse than what you wanted to be. So. Just try it. I mean, just keep trying some new things. It's a great opportunity to make good tries. Um, Eric, do you want to add something? I have another question before we end up the time. 
we, we cannot move forward more than one more question, but yeah, could you, would you like to share your answer? Because it totally aligns with what Maria and Monica said, and it's an exercise from the Watson curriculum called Daring Greatly. And we first, and I'm going to challenge, especially the students, but really everyone on the call to think about doing this in your own life. We start by challenging the students to fail 10 times in a row. So they have to choose something to do, but it has to be so hard that they know they will fail doing it 10 times in a row. And if they don't fail 10 times in a row, they have to choose something harder. So while we're all locked in our houses and can't do much, well, maybe what that could be is reaching out to people that you admire and respect you've never spoken with before and ask them to have a conversation. And you'd be surprised, it's very difficult to fail 10 times in a row at that. Um, and so we prime students to feel comfortable with failure, and then we ask them to dare greatly. And to then choose something that seems so above their expectations, what they could ever hope to do, that they have to dare greatly to go out and do it. And we then ask them to, to dare greatly and choose one thing that they've been wanting to do, take so much courage to do and actually go out and do it. So I'd, I'd challenge everyone to, you know, first try to fail 10 times in a row and then dare greatly with one specific thing. Wow, I think that's a very, very amazing exercise, actually. And uh, well, we have read about entrepreneurship saying, I mean, in these topics, fail fast. I mean, so just give it a try. And right now, I think another interesting thing is like these rounds of failing or trying have, have to be faster. I mean, we cannot do things that we will have feedback in a great long time we need things like moving faster and that makes it a whole thing okay um last question this is from cynthia gonzalez this is an opportunity for parents to engage more intimately in the lives of our children and play a more active role in shaping their characters do you have any advice for parents to help their kids to reshape their future great question Great question to someone that it's not a mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you are a daughter. <laughs> but I'm a daughter. That's that's what I was gonna say. And um, it has been amazing, as I as I said, to to learn from my parents and from they from from them to learn from me as well in this time of con confinement. So, so I think that's that's a uh, that's something that I really have tried. It's how can I learn from my parents by teaching them right now. And and it, it's been it's been an amazing. I have I have also a lot of conversations with with friends that are mothers and that are facing all this you know difficult situation of having confined kids and also uh, with everything that happened with racism in the last few weeks. How can you start having these uh, types of conversation of what's going on? You know, put COVID aside. There are a lot of things in the world that are going going on right now despite of the difficult situation that we're all facing, but having those conversations and, and, and trying to find, you know, there are so many amazing, I, I found some books, eBooks for mm -hmm. children to learn about books, about racism, about so many, you know, interesting topics that right now I think it's, it's, it's the way to go, to go and, and, and try to look for from some tools that, that are in the web. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. You know something, and I was thinking when while I was hearing you, is and we have so much to learn from our kids. I mean, they have great questions, great observations, comments, lessons that can help us learn so much from them too. So I think it's it's a opening up opportunities of learning from many persons that are around and that maybe we don't hear that frequently because we are too busy moving forward towards whatever we had as a plan before. And now we are discovering something new and reshaping that future. How about you, Eric? Um, well, actually, I'm very curious. I want to know the answer to this question too, <laughs> as a new father. So my turn to take over, Monica, in addition to being an amazing leader, you're also an incredible mother. So I'd love oh, to hear your you. answer to this question, if you'd be willing to share. Wow, that's a, a difficult question. I think that um, first of all is taking advantage of every minute that right now we have with our families. I was thinking this is the longest time in my life I have ever been locked down with my family. I mean, because uh, I remember even when I was suspecting I had my first baby, my second baby, I 
just took like 15 days and I was back working because I was have always been like that. So taking advantage of those moments of discovering conversations, also being a, an observer of silence. I was reading the other day um, in a very interesting uh, publication regarding young people and the role of silence is important, but it's also dangerous. I mean, if you have a very silent person near you, you have to be aware because it could be confusion or it can be um, a total um, process of introspection that it can also be difficult. And uh, you have to be aware of those kind of things all the time. So I could think uh, also a very important thing is uh, discuss about dreams that your kids have and discuss, discuss with them about some of their questions that they have about life or topics and uh, get together towards discovering together some of those things that you don't have the answers, but that you can discover together. And I think that's so powerful. I love so much talking with my two son and daughter. They are dreamers. They are great um, uh, hard workers. And uh, I love to discuss with them ideas of what they are thinking for their future and discovering together and learning together. I think that many times as parents, we see like different levels of learning, but we ha can learn so much from them and also with them. So I think that's a powerful thing to do. And um, it, do it doesn't matter how old are them because they always teach us great things. Well, so moving towards the end, I could engage with that question so I can stay here for half an hour <laughs> just discussing and discovering with you. But I would like to make a, a very fast closing of what we have heard today and also to invite you for the next, um, the next UFM talk. So first, I would like to remember some of the great things that we mentioned today. Hope is about planning. And in planning the vision in a moment like now, very turbulent, very confusing, the vision is empowering. The vision is inspiring to move forward. Second, I mean, uh, faster movements, smaller spe steps are very relevant in today's world. Third, fear is your best fuel to keep moving forward. And remember, resources are there. Start by identifying the persons that you know that can be a good point to start conversations to discover how can you start reshaping your own future. So keep it simple. Enjoy the process, even though it's a very difficult time, but you can always find joy wherever we are. And thank you for joining us. Now I'm jumping to Spanish uh, to say uh, thank you and Queremos recordarles que el próximo UFM Talk será sobre resiliencia, compasión y gratitud, su impacto en el sistema inmune ante la pandemia. Este es impartido por la Facultad de Medicina y será transmitido también por UFM Facebook Live y newmedia.ufm.edu mañana a las 10 de la mañana. No se lo pierdan y muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos esta noche. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Gracias, Mónica.